nine watts out of a tube amplifier for 600 bucks. That is pretty wild. With constant transconductance output stage with fusion architecture depletion MOSFET gain fallback. What the f I want to thank Ship for sending this out for review. They're of course not paying or asking me to say anything good or bad. All thoughts here are my own. The show does have a sponsor, but it's actually going to be me. I'm launching a new logo design and I think it looks pretty sick. I made some t-shirts. Mine's still in the mail, so I'm still waiting to get that one. But there's also this really sick phone case. Uh, you can find links to these down below. They really do help the show out. Thank you so much. I do have to apologize for the audio for today. There's a little bit of construction going on outside of the shop. so. Hopefully it doesn't get picked up too much. I'm going to try to cover it with music and close proximity to the microphone. Hopefully that will help. But if a little bit gets through, I apologize about that. I'm going to try my best. So admittedly, the nine watts thing is a little bit of me making an overdramatic intro. In reality, this makes nine watts into 16 ohms, which is very, very efficient. It makes about six watts into 32 ohms. It's funny how six watts sounds more reasonable than nine, even though six watts is still ridiculous. So let's talk about the Lear Plus. This is a very interesting solid state slash tube amplifier. Now the build quality similar to most of Shit's products is pretty decent. Uh, it doesn't particularly stand out as being amazing these days, though the updated chassis design is something that I think uh, is appreciated from my perspective. I like that they're embracing slightly new looks. And the thing I'm talking about mostly is the kind of circular top end that they have for their kind of uh, their uh, heat dispersion design. Now, some shit is known for being a pretty like uh, kind of dry humor type of company. I do want to give them a little bit of shit for their audiophile speak on their website. Like you basically need a master's in audiophile lingo to understand what any of this means sometimes. So I get that this is like technically what it is, but like, holy crap, it's hard to get through. It's a coherence, fully discrete current mode, non-inverting 6SN7, which is the tube with constant transconductance output stage with fusion architecture, depletion, MOSFET gain fallback. <laughs> what the fuck? I have no idea what I'm supposed to get from that but I thought it was kind of funny. In terms of stuff that we can actually all use, it's got a S or a 6SN7 uh, tube inside of it, uh, which is a fairly common, not too crazy, not too cheap tube. It's kind of middle of the road. It's a pretty good tube. It does have a 64 step relay ladder, which makes the clicky noises when you turn the volume. It is slightly delayed and it doesn't necessarily accelerate at the same rate as your finger does. It has to kind of catch up a little bit. This does come with a remote which controls just about every feature on this device. And a uh, side note to the remote is that it is actually magnetic, which means that you can actually just plop this on the side of the device and it will stay there. Careful around planar headphones. Just word to the wise. In terms of the features in the build of this thing, it does have two inputs, uh, both RCA. It does have a pre-output. It does have two gain stage settings. It has a, a button that you can press and hold to switch from solid state mode to tube state mode, which I will talk about in a second because it's slightly annoying. And even though the whole thing has a ton of power, it is not balanced. It is quarter inch. Uh, unbalanced only. Now, the one major complaint that I have about this thing is like, I'm a nerd who likes to go back and forth between my sound signatures. I like to, to really compare, I like to A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B all day. With this, it's kind of difficult though, because uh, the switching between the solid state mode and the tube state mode actually takes a really long time. So this is gonna click off once I press this. I'm not gonna press it just yet. It's gonna click off, there's gonna be delay, and then when you hear it click again, that means that it is in the new mode. So this is how long it takes to switch between solid state mode and tube state mode and back. Okay, you'll hear it click. It clicked, and then we're waiting and you can't adjust anything, you can't hear, there it goes. So there's a, a relatively big delay. And when you're trying to listen to differences, like you can pick them up between the two modes, um, but it, it's really not as quick as I would prefer it to be. If it could just switch somehow, uh, I know that's like, it's easy to ask for and very hard to do, but I would love to just be able to compare just really quickly uh, between the two modes. That would be really preferential for me.
Now, when it comes to the solid state sound signature, I'm not gonna be talking about this a whole lot. And the reason why is because it is an okay solid state amplifier. It doesn't have particularly awesome sound characteristics compared to other equivalently-ish priced amplifiers like this A90D. I prefer the A90D as a solid state through and through for 100 hundred ish bucks less. Um, now the advantage to this thing is that you have the option of either solid state or tube. And if you only want one, you can have both. So it's hard to kind of place where exactly to compare this to what devices to compare this to. Is it fair to split the, the difference down the middle for the price and just say, okay, like it's a $300 solid state amplifier and it's a $300 tube state amplifier. Um, and then compare against things in that price range or is it more fair to compare against things that are the total equivalent price tag i'm not sure but the other reason why i don't want to talk about the solid state too much here is because uh not only do i not like it as much as the tube uh option for it but i also think that most people are just going to be buying it for the tube performance that's historically what people have bought the Lear for anyways so it's cool that it has it it's a fun mode if you're wondering what the sound signature is like and why i don't like it as much it's really about the cleanliness of the signal it does have a tiny bit of like a, a noise floor to it um, it doesn't have as great a dynamics as the a90d and the saturation to the timbre is not nearly as uh, rich and inviting as the A90D is. And you also notice some dynamic limitations for things like bass response. The A90D just feels a little bit more live. But let's talk about the tube performance. Except for that slight noise floor, which is constant on some uh, headphones that are, are relatively efficient, I think the performance here is very, very solid. And this blows away a lot of one, uh, some of my favorite uh, tube amplifiers uh, that are kind of sub $1,000 like the Dark Voice. Uh, this is miles ahead of the Dark Voice in terms of tonal accuracy while still inviting some extra warmth into the signal. It also has a lot more details in the top end. It doesn't seem to glaze over that area too much and make it glary like the uh, Dark Voice does. And the bass handling is just far superior to something like a Dark Voice. So if you're using the Dark Voice as a comparator here, the Dark Voice is uh, not nearly as clean or as detailed or as uh, dynamic as uh, this tube amplifier is. Now, a dynamic headphone that I've been using a lot and talking about a lot is the 109 Pro. So I thought it'd be fair to, to hop this on here. And this amplifier handles this very well. It slightly reduces the slightly bright uh, top end that this thing has, especially for upper end female vocalists. People like Lana Del Rey, uh, they don't have quite as glary vocals as they do on a solid state uh, amplifier or something like that dark voice. Compared to the A90D, I was actually surprised to see this, but on the 109 Pro, I found that the imaging and the sound staging was actually more wide ranging and more specific for imaging and wider sounding for the sound staging on the Lear. This is not a change I expected to see on this amplifier with this headphone, but it took me by surprise by uh, being noticeably better uh, for certain sounds. One of the songs, for example, is Within from, from Daft Punk. Uh, not only is the piano uh, staging a little bit wider on the Lear than it is on the A90D, but also the chimes that come in, I think, I think it's like a one minute, 28 seconds or one minute, 48 seconds, somewhere around there. Uh, the chimes that kind of go from the right channel to the left channel uh, are more specific and they also have like a wider dispersion pattern uh, and I found it to be quite nice. Those same characteristics transferred over to something like A6XX, which is another dynamic headphone. And I actually found that this played a little bit better with the tube amplifier, to nobody's surprise, uh, than the solid state. Now with a more expensive, more demanding planar, this is where uh, things were some good and some bad. The coloration of timbre is not as good on the Lear Plus as it is on something like an A90D. Uh, I would not even play this headphone on a dark voice. It just doesn't sound good. It doesn't, it can't handle the, the power requirements and the bass just really gets messed up, really distorted on the dark voice. This handles the bass better than that dark voice, but the A90D just handles the bass just far superior than both of those. Now this lower saturation was really noticeable on higher octave instruments like violins, but actually lower octave instruments, I found the Lear Plus to actually be a little bit better for timbre and a little bit warmer and more colorful than the A90D. Now the A90D is probably a better reference point here, but in terms of enjoyability, I really liked things like cello and bass on the TC with the Lear Plus. But I would say that overall dynamic slam and capability and overall timbre was slightly better 
on the A90D. So while I think that unlike a lot of two amp fires, this actually performs very well for planars, it still isn't going to beat my solid state options for planars personally. But when it comes to dynamic headphones, you still have this classic question of, do you want a more technical solid state sound or do you want a more saturated, slightly less correct uh, sound from a tube, something that is a little bit more syrupy, a little bit more inviting. Uh, in this particular case, a little bit wider for the two headphones that I tested it on. These are all decisions that you had to make. As far as my review, it's hard to judge this thing based off the price. It's very powerful, but it's also unique in the market. Not a lot of things do what this does, and definitely not a lot of things do what this does as well as this does. Now, because this is so unique, it ends up getting the same recommendation that any unique product gets, which is if it fits your circumstances, yeah, sure, I can totally recommend it. Um, if you just are looking for a more pure sound though, um, I'm going to recommend something like a, a solid state amplifier over this. Shit has some options. Um, I was using an A90D just as a reference, but that's a great option as well. So yeah, I think that's going to be the review of the Lear Plus. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.